So, today we are about 10 kilometers from Lake Rotorua and we are on the Mamaku Plateau. And as you can see behind me, we have a spectacular rock pinnacle and some very interesting landforms in this area. There is a mystery, a geological mystery here, and I do not know the answer. But next to me, we have a highly esteemed Bruce Hayward, who I strongly Cut suspect... <laughs> Get rid of the esteemed <laughs> Next to me, we have the incredible Bruce Hayward, <laughs> who um, has, a, has a lot going on upstairs, and I, su I suspect he has a, he has a, a, a few uh, challenges for me to work out. And Bruce has kept the secret, if you like, of this geological formation away from me. So we're going to try to struggle with this question of how they got here. How were they formed? So... Bruce, could you give us a background to where we are and what, uh, what we've got here and then tell us what the big challenging questions are. We've got all these small conical mounds and pinnacles. Each conical mound often has hard rock on the top, but occasionally the cone has gone and we've just got the pinnacle like we see here. The rocks themselves are ignimbrite and they came out from Lekarotorua in a big eruption, in fact a super eruption, an eruption style that is the largest we get on Earth. Gas and frothy pumice and ash spread out across the land in all directions at great speed in a big cloud of this hot ash and pumice. And slowly it cooled, compacted and solidified. And that happened about 240,000 years ago. And now we have a sheet here that was originally about 100 metres thick right across forming the plateau today. The sheet of pumice and ash was so hot here that some of the pumice particles collapsed down from being rather circular to rather flattened because they were still so hot and plastic. But also it was so hot that the glass and the pumice all welded together and we got a, a very hard welded rock. As it, it cooled and contracted, we got cooling cracks or contraction cracks that are largely vertical and we see these vertical faces which are those cooling cracks in the rocks forming the tops of these cones. Over time slabs of the rock have fallen away on these fractures and we're left with just the single column. My question is how is it that we only have these remnants dotted around the landscape of what was once completely covering the area and we don't see boulders in the gaps between them, so we don't see the eroded material. Yes, so up here there's no streams, no rivers, so the big mystery has always been where is all this weathered debris and how did it disappear? Okay folks, so there's a challenge. Can you think of a mechanism in which the eroded material between these pinnacles has been removed from the landscape. I would love your thoughts. So before Bruce maybe takes us further into the, the answer to that challenge, pause this video shortly and write in the comments how you think this eroded rock has disappeared from the spaces in between these pinnacles. I'd love to know your ideas. Now, I still don't know the answer, and I'm still stumped by a couple of questions. So, the first one is, if some force has eroded this material, it seems to have done it, leaving the remnants, these pinnacles and these little conical hills, broadly scattered across the landscape. It seems to have nibbled away right across a broad area, and that area is about 100 square kilometres we've got here. It's got these hills and, and, and pinnacles scattered all over it, moderately evenly spaced. An obvious thought could be um, a big glacier came along in the Ice Age and scooped the material away. But, firstly, this area was not glaciated. It was not under an ice sheet in the last Ice Age, or even several Ice Ages. So... I think that's eliminated. The climate has definitely cooled uh, at times and got warmer at other times and maybe that's something. But it wasn't a river, it wasn't a glacier 
I'm waiting with bated breath <laughs> for Bruce to kind of take us a little step deeper into this challenge and see what we what you can tell me. Well, first off, Julian is getting there. <laughs> in the last 240,000 years, in the climate cycles, the Ice Age climate cycles, there have been two major glacial periods, Ice Age periods. One around about 150,000 odd years ago, peaked then, and the more recent one which peaked 20,000 years ago, but was very cold, much colder than now for long periods since the eruption. And we know from pollen analysis that it wasn't forested for long periods during those colder ice ages. It was often subalpine or alpine tussock land. And so erosion could have been a lot faster than it is now during those cold periods. And we know that these rocks have got these joints and fractures through them. So water getting into those fractures would freeze and it would start to push the rocks apart. And that over time it will break it into whole lots of small fragments. And they get smaller and smaller and there'd be some weathering. And so we'd end up with quite fine grain material. But we also know that during those cold periods, the winds could be a lot stronger. And I believe it's the wind that has probably eroded most of the material here and taken it away during those Ice Age periods since the eruption. Does that fully explain the fact that we have lots of these dotted hills scattered broadly across the landscape? Why weren't they all removed by the wind? Why are some of them, uh, quite a lot of them, left behind? You're quite right. We would expect it to be fairly evenly eroded down. And it could be the rock in the centre of these cones are harder than the rock which has been eroded away. So the question then is, how did we get these scattered little areas of hardened rock? And we know that these ignimbrites, especially the thicker sheets, have a lot of gas still trapped in them as they're cooling and the welding is starting. And that gas tends to, over time, rise up to the surface. So we've got gas escape pipes or roots. And as that gas has come through the ignimbrite, it's cemented the rock. It's altered it, and therefore it's more resistant to erosion. And so we've got all these gas escape pipes everywhere forming the core of each one of these conical hills. Well, we've answered why we've got a finger-like pinnacle, but we haven't answered why we've got most of them are cones capped with a hard rock or got a centre of hard rock. What is the cone material that's around them? Ah, OK. I was assuming it was going to be boulders that had just fallen off the sides and not quite got removed by the wind. Well, that's what I would think too. But let's go and see where a road cut has gone through one of these mounds and see if that is the case. Here we can see it's not. It's all ignimbrite largely forming the, the hill shape. And it's mantled by about a metre thickness of orange, uh, friable volcanic ash. So 15,000 years ago, this was the, the ground level, and it's hard, solid, ignimbrite in this shape. And so during those Ice Age periods, we had a fairly hard surface underneath each of these tors or, or conical hills. Here in the centre, we can see these vertical cooling fractures going up through it. And this rock here is really rock hard. It's really cemented by presumably that gas coming up through this zone from within the ignimbrite and hardening the rock. We didn't need a river, we didn't need a glacier. The vast layer of ignimbrite between these tors was much softer. The tors were hardened by gas seeping up from below through these vertical channels so that everything else could be blown away, leaving them behind. These are the only ignimbrite tors we see in New Zealand. And around the world, tors made of ignimbrite are very rare indeed. So here we have a very special area of world significance.